our guest on the program is uh <clears throat> excuse me i need to put my glasses back on because i just got blurry <laughs> i think i just aged for just a moment michael summer schultz uh via telephone michael good morning to you how are you sir good morning guys how are you doing this morning excellent thank you very much you are an attorney out of the charleston area correct i am i've been an attorney my entire career in west virginia out of charleston uh, and I'm running, as you indicated, for the Intermediate Court of Appeals because I think my 31 years, over 31 years, really, experience litigating throughout the state, including where you are in Martinsburg, is perfect. It's, it's perfect experience to equip me to be on the Intermediate Court of Appeals. The uh, thing that you share in common with one of my co-hosts is a certain university... Uh, you both have a degree from there. Yours is a law degree. Mr. Gilstrap also went to William & Mary, but not for law. I have a bachelor's in history from the College oh, of am. Knowledge. 300 years of I tradition am. unhampered by progress. <laughs> <laughs> what better place to get a history degree than in Virginia, where obviously so much American history took place? Uh, I tell you what, I have a, a, an undergrad in history as well, and I have a master's degree in history from the University of Virginia. And it was only after I got the master's degree in history I decided to go to law school. So we share that passion of history. So after killing time at UVA, you realized you had to cleanse your soul by going to William & Mary <laughs> to get that stink off of you. I understand how that works, sir. You know, I couldn't have said it better myself. You're exactly correct. <laughs> oh, my goodness. I'm not sure what happened here. <clears throat> so uh, why the decision to run for the Intermediate Court of Appeals at this time, Michael? Well, Rob, you put your finger on it. The court is fairly new. It was actually established by legislation in early 2021 by our legislature, and then it went live on July 1, 2022. It's a three-judge court, and it's a lower profile. I know that part of this campaign is actually going to be educating the public on not only what the court is, but what kind of cases it hears and the role that it plays in the state's judiciary, because I believe it's an absolutely critical part of our judicial system. And I decided to put my hat in the ring because, again, with my 31 years experience, the type of cases that go before the intermediate court are the types of cases that I have experience in. The, the four types very generally are civil litigation appeals. That's primarily what I've done for over 31 years. There are workers' compensation claims that are appealed to, that, to the Intermediate Court of Appeals, and I have experience in that. Not, I don't do a lot of direct workers' compensation claims, but through my work for deliberate intent, on deliberate intent claims, you have to be familiar with the statute. And I was involved in discussions in 2015 that led to changes to the workers' compensation statute by the legislature that year. The third area is family law matters, and I actually think that this probably is one of the most critical roles of the Intermediate Court of Appeals, because traditionally, and this isn't a criticism, but there were not a lot of written family law decisions out of our Supreme Court, just because the Supreme Court took everything, literally. And one of the critical roles that this Intermediate Court has played in the first 17 months it's been actually up and going and will continue to play is issuing written decisions in family law matters that will provide guidance for not only parties but also lawyers who practice in that area. And the fourth area of appeals to the court is uh, our administrative appeals through state agencies, administrative law judges, and again, not a huge part of what I've done in my past, but I have handled matters before state uh, ALJs and, and through various administrative agencies. So my, my experience fits perfectly with the kinds of cases that are going to be tried or, or be appealed to this court, and that's why I'm running, because I think my experience makes me perfectly suited for it. You are running, excuse me, you are running for the seat held by Judge Thomas E. Scar, who was appointed to an initial two-year term, but he's not going to run for re-election, correct? Correct. I know Judge Scar, I've known him for a very long time, and he was appointed to the two-year term, and he has is indicated that he is not going to be running again. I have the, the utmost respect for Judge Scar, and actually for all three of the judges, uh, Judge Greer, Dan Greer, and, and Judge uh, Charlie Lawrence, and I think they have done a, a great job in getting that court up and running. And really, whoever gets that seat, obviously, hopefully it would be me. I view my job as continuing 
the great start and to take it even further. John Gilstrap. What are the, I I find the idea of running for judge to be kind of an interesting challenge from the the candidate perspective. What are the, what are the principles or the elements of a campaign in running for judge that, especially if there's another, I don't know if there's a competitor for this race or not, but, but what are the elements you, you really, a judge needs to, by definition, stay in the middle of things. So how, how does that campaign shape? How do, you, how do you message what it is that you would accomplish as a judge without crossing the line into not being, uh, you know, down down the middle? Uh, John, I, I got to tell you that is a great question because it's a William and Mary uh, education got to be. <laughs> well, that was assumed, wasn't it? <laughs> I'll use smaller uh, words for the people here in the audience in in, in, in the in, in the studio, but <laughs> I, I understand the pain you you, you feel. Trust me. Um, but that's a great question because there are a lot more limits on a judicial candidate for office than there are on, say, somebody running for governor or for attorney general or for the House or the Senate. Specifically, judicial candidates personally cannot ask for money. People on my, uh, on my behalf can ask for money, but we cannot ask directly for money. That's a no-no. We cannot directly comment upon specific issues that may come before the court. So if you were to ask me some very specific issue uh, on a workers' compensation claim or on a family law matter that may end up coming before the court, I can't comment upon that. So given those bumpers, and it's incumbent upon all judicial candidates to know what the rules are in terms of what you can and cannot comment upon during the campaign, uh, it it really is difficult, and you have to be careful about what you do say. That's why, to be honest, and and there are going to be others who are in the race, I'd rather focus on my experience in these four areas that come before the intermediate court, because I, I do firmly believe that when the official filing period ends in late January, I'm going to be far and away the most experienced candidate and the only one who has the breadth of experience in all four areas and the depth of experience, again, over 31 years litigating all over this great state. Corey Roman. Yeah, since, um, and thank you for that response, it was great, and the the questions around the table were were so amazing that I I think they plucked a few off of my list here, Um, so I'm going to go with my my bonus question. Um, I was doing a little bit of research on you last night, um, and I I found, did you, do you still broadcast UC basketball games? I do, in fact, last night I was doing a preparation for the UC Fairmont State basketball games this Saturday, and also UC West Liberty Hilltoppers. West Liberty comes to UC next Wednesday. So I've been doing and Actually, I'm in my 15th year, Corey. Uh, it started just basketball, but I've branched out, and now I am doing color commentary, some play-by-play for UC men's and women's volleyball, men's and women's soccer, uh, and football. Awesome. No, so I... I... I it's think a lot of fun. when I was looking down through your bio and, you know, I saw, um, you know, all of the, the different accomplishments and then the, the broadcasting really stuck out to me because I just thought that was awesome and not something you would probably see with somebody else who has your background as well. Um, so it also raised the question to me, though, if you are going to be broadcasting during the winter here, do, is it is that going to hinder your campaign at all? It's not in this sense. And again, I said earlier that it's absolutely crucial for judicial candidates to know the rules. Uh, You may have also seen in my bio that I am a co-host of a weekly sports talk show on local radio down here in Charleston, which is broadcast over the air. During my candidacy, pursuant to FCC rules, I will not be, I'm going to take a leave of absence from the weekly broadcast radio show. Uh, because I'm rec- I really need to because of FCC rules. Those FCC rules, however, do not apply to live stream sporting events. Mm. So all of the University of Charleston sporting events are live streamed, and those that I do not have to give up because it's an exception to the FCC rules. So I will continue to call the 
University of Charleston games because they're live streamed. I will not be doing the the sports talk show because it's broadcast over the air. See here, I'm I'm envisioning the appeals court judge doing the color commentary, and it goes something like this: Well, Rob. Back in 1978, during the WVU game versus Shepard, it was adjudicated that that call was not appropriate. So, <laughs> you know, kind of have appeals of, of, of calls on the, on the floor. It'd be kind of interesting. <laughs> well, it's more like when I was at the Butcher Center back when Shepard was still in the Mountaineers Conference. And I would, there would be some action down, down in the lane. I would say, well, that was a felony in at least 13 jurisdictions, but the ref <laughs> didn't blow his whistle. <laughs> and I know, because I'm an attorney. Uh, by the way, well, while Mr. Gilstrap was trying to be superior to all of us with his William & Mary education, <laughs> he, of course, as educated as he is, blew his cover by saying that WVU would have been playing Shepard, which we and Corey would both know, despite our, <laughs> Never despite our lack of a William & Mary education, we would know that game doesn't take place. If you do remember, though, a couple years ago, they did have an exhibition. They had an exhibition. And Shepard got I was gonna, blown out of the water. <laughs> WVU and Marshall both but no, have they exhibition wouldn't. games against teams from the Mountaineers Conference. Yes. So, I mean, that's entirely You're, possible. But we all know there are exhibition hecklers games. in the studio. Oh, we all know exhibition <laughs> games don't count. My Shepard uh, education didn't, oh. didn't point that way. <laughs> Corey, you got to put an L up beside your head. That's inside inside baseball stuff. There, you have to keep it up there because it'll move your camera back. By the way, you got like an Uber Uber. He, he, he's really uh, close serious up right now. Yeah, totally. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, Colin's going to come in and help you with that in a second here too. So uh, Michael, uh, we, since the governor has continued to coach basketball while being governor, can you be an intermediate court of appeals judge and continue to do play by play? I can. What it means is I'm going to have to just work hard. And that's one of the things you want from judges, right? You want judges to work hard, be fair, and to get through the caseload that is in front of them. And so absolutely, I can continue to do it. It just means that I may be working more at night. And it may mean if there are prior commitments that I'm going to have to leave it to my play-by-play guy to go solo for, for a game or two. But uh, it's not going to interfere because I'm I'm firmly committed to the principle that justice delayed is justice denied. And you mentioned that it was the the intermediate court was finally passed. The primary criticism of of establishing this court was that it would add an extra layer and delay finality to cases that now get adjudicated first at the immediate court before going to the the Supreme Court, and I'm committed to making sure that the cases that come before the intermediate court get addressed timely, because that case to the parties is incredibly important. It may be one of hundreds before the court, but to the parties, that matter is incredibly important, and that's why it's, it's absolutely critical for this court to timely get through its caseload. And I wouldn't let my outside activities, like for UC or anything else, my work for for Leadership West Virginia and, and, and my church or anything like that interfere with timely getting through my work. Michael, you've been an attorney, I think, 31 years, correct? A little over 31 years. I came here, not born here, not raised here, but I came here voluntarily in the summer of 1992. And just as importantly, I have stayed here. I've chosen to stay here since then. And... In the time you spent in a court, I'm sure by now you can tell the difference between a good and fair judge and one who isn't necessarily that. Some judges, just like anybody in any occupation, are better at it than others. What makes for a good judge from your courtroom experience in terms of what's, uh, when you leave, you go, well, yeah, I think that all, whether I won or lost, I think that went fairly. You know, that's a great question, and I'm going to defer to a a a prominent plaintiff's lawyer who is actually on, I generally do defense cases, but a prominent plaintiff's trial lawyer uh, answered that exact question recently, and I think he's absolutely correct. You want your judges to be smart, you want them to work hard, and you want them to be fair. I'm going to leave to others as to whether I'm smart at all. I think I have over 31 years of, of uh, track record showing that I, I will work hard. I will go anywhere and do and litigate anywhere and anything. And in terms of being fair, I mean, that's really what you want as a lawyer. You want to feel like you, what you write 
in briefs has been has been read and you can tell when you're in front of a judge if it's been read because you can tell from the questions you want a judge to listen because if you if you write something that you want the judge to read and you are answering questions or making an argument and the judge is listening you feel like you are being treated fairly and that the judge even if he or she rules against you has taken your viewpoint into consideration there's nothing worse as a lawyer than feeling like nothing that you wrote was was read and nothing that you said the judge even listened to uh, I want to talk a little bit about the, the mechanics of of appealing a case first of all to the outside observer it seems like it takes a long time uh, once a decision is made and then there's the there's the promise of the appeal and then you know it kind of drones on what actually happens if 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 I'm a litigant and I appeal my case what steps have to happen before it actually goes in front of the judges if it goes in front of the judges generally speaking and I know this is going to be a little dry for your listeners, but generally speaking, what happens is once there is a final order entered that is going to be appealed, you have th the, the party that is going to appeal has 30 days to file a notice of appeal. After those 30 days, the court is going to issue what's called a scheduling order. And that order will have deadlines by which the briefs are going to be filed. You have an initial opening brief by the party appealing. You have a response to that initial brief, and then you have a reply to the response. After that briefing is completed, then the court will determine whether or not oral argument is going to be, is going to be heard. Sometimes the court will just decide on the written briefs. Sometimes there are questions that a, a member of the court or members of the court will have, and so they'll schedule oral argument. One of the great things about the intermediate court is considering the types of cases that are going to be before it, it established five remote courtrooms where attorneys on behalf of clients that may not be able to pay for lawyers to travel all the way to Charleston in person, the lawyers can appear at these remote courtrooms and make the arguments live to the judges sitting in Charleston. One of those re uh, remote courtrooms is in Morgan County. It's in Berkeley Springs. So if there's a litigant in the eastern panhandle that may not be able to pay for an attorney to come all the way down here, that attorney can just go over to Berkeley Springs and make the argument. After the argument, if there is argument, or if there is no argument, after the briefing is complete, it may take one to four months, generally, to get a written decision. So, again, this intermediate court has only been in existence for 17 months or so, and I think that they have done a good job in timely getting cases adjudicated, disposed of, handled, decided that come before them. And certainly, as I indicated, that's one of the things that, that I'm absolutely committed to because, again, these matters are important to the parties involved. Corey. Yeah, I'm going to go to our comments section here and uh, read off one of the questions we have. Alonzo Perry, who's um, a co-host of this show, sometimes he he wrote, "What is your what is your ju judicial philosophy? Um, is it is it judicial activism, originalism, or is it something else? Can you explain it to us?" <laughs> Good question. My judicial philosophy is to be fair and apply the law. I don't think that, judge, that judges or courts should be setting policy. That's for the legislature working with the governor. It's the legislative and executive branch. Courts should not be activist courts. Courts should apply the law to the facts before them. If the law is unclear, then it's, the courts should be trying to determine what the legislature meant in passing the law. And I'm not going to get too far into the weeds because it's dry and it's boring, but there's a whole series of principles and rules that courts must follow when interpreting what a statute or a regulation means. It shouldn't be what the court thinks it should mean. It should be what the legislature intended. So uh, I'm a firm believer that courts shouldn't be activist, and they should be clarifying the law where it needs to be clarified and just simply applying the law to the facts in front of it. 
Michael Summer Schultz has been our guest here as a candidate for the West Virginia Intermediate Court of Appeals. And this is the seat Judge Scar had uh, for two years and uh, will not be seeking uh, another term. So this is a 10-year term. These are staggered terms. Uh, in the future, uh, Michael, have you have you eyed the actual West Virginia State Supreme Court as a possible destination? I haven't. I'll be honest. The intermediate court, I think, is where my skill set fits best. The intermediate court is a lot lower profile, <laughs> and this might sound strange since I'm obviously on the air with radio and, and doing the UC games, but you know what? I really like to just do quality work, and I don't like to be in the limelight. I don't need to be in the limelight. And I think that the academic side, the intellectual side to the work performed by the intermediate court fits perfectly with what I like in the practice of law and in the litigation. And uh, I also like the education. I know this court works hard going around the state. I'd like to have even more oral arguments held throughout the state in order to expose the public, high school students, college students, to the workings of the court. Uh, the intermediate court holds one oral argument per term at a remote location. I'd like to I'd like to see more of that, and uh, I just I have no desire to be honest to sit on the West Virginia Supreme Court, which is a much more high profile, political slanted body. It's not a criticism; it's a fact. Than it, the intermediate court of appeals is or should be. So this next one is a personal question based on your profession because we share a profession. I did play-by-play for, uh, I guess, 25 years and had a blast doing it. So how does a person who is studying history and then law become a play-by-play guy for a college basketball team? Well, you know what? It all fits together, believe it or not, because I've always believed, by the way, I was actually an associate or adjunct professor of history at West Virginia State for over 17 years, teaching a history class every semester. And I always thought that that was very helpful to my career as a lawyer because it forced me to speak on my feet and to somehow make it interesting and get important points across because trying to make history interesting to college students these days, trust me, it's not easy. (laughs) And I had a very good friend who was actually a play-by-play announcer for UC, and we used to sit around on the couch during Monday night football or basketball games and just kind of our own banter, our own talk, mimicked what the announcers were doing. So when he got the the job to be the play-by-play at the University of Charleston, uh, after a couple years, the, the guy who was doing the color left. He said, hey, you want to do this? And so that was in 2008. And I said, sure. He said, it's just like sitting on the couch like we used to do. (laughs) And it just kind of took off from there. And again, it benefits my legal career because think about what those announcers have to do. They have to see something. They have to mentally process it. They have to formulate the words to describe the action or to analyze what's going on. And then they have to say it in a way that's halfway intelligible that the listening or watching audience understands. That's kind of like appearing in court. Good point. Were you an athlete yourself? Did you play sports? I uh, played sports, still play a lot of tennis. I have not handed in my resi- or my retirement papers to the NBA because I'm holding out hope of a 10-day contract. You, that's, a fletch, that's a fletch line right there, baby. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I did play sports growing up. I'm, I love sports. I love all sports. And the funny thing is, I actually like the stories behind the headlines. I like the games are fine, and I obviously love the games. But live sports, I encourage everyone to go out and see live sports, including at the D2 level. You've got a great sports program there at Shepherd University. Um, and I love playing sports, just staying active. Hey, it was great talking with you, Michael. How do people find out more about your campaign for the ICA? Guys, I... Uh, enjoyed it appreciate it have a great rest of the day real real quick again how do people find out more about your campaign for intermediate court my website is michael schultz for wv that's m-y-c-h-a-l s-c-h-u-l-z f-o-r-w-v dot com thank you sir appreciated your time this morning thanks guys